Hey guys, I'm super excited to have Julie Sands with Louisville ISD with us today. Uh, Julie is the senior project manager for Louisville ISD. Louisville is located about 25 miles from downtown Dallas, and it's one of the fastest growing school districts in Texas with over 50,000 students enrolled across 60 campuses. In 2017, voters approved a $737 million bond package to renovate existing campuses and build several new ones, including two new elementary schools, a new middle school, multi-purpose facilities for two high schools, and a new career and technology center. To say she's busy would be an understatement, but I'm so grateful she took some time to join the Owner Insight podcast. We're super excited to have her. So with no further ado, allow me to introduce you to Julie Sands. Hey. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Doing well. So are, are you excited? I, I actually, I am. After reading <laughs> the questions, you know, at first I thought, uh, there, I don't really have anything. There's nothing interesting about me. But then I read your question, the questions and sort of the, the, um, the goal uh -huh. of the call. Yep. And then I realized, oh, I'm the perfect person for this call. Okay. <laughs> I'm on. I'm in. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, I'm ready. Thank, thank you so much for agreeing to do it. We're we're actually already recording, so I'll cut some of that out. But I mean, this is this is going to be a lot of fun. So, just it's a conversation between friends. So that's it. Sounds good. All right. So let's dive in. So Julie, welcome to the Owner Insight Podcast. This is part of our Women in Construction series, and we're super excited. You are technically our first guest for the series. So you're going to be the one that sets the bar so high that everybody will try to achieve in their, their episodes. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> you have set the bar. I'm ready. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I want, I'm all about origin story. And so one of the things that I want to do is get a better understanding of kind of what attracted you to this career path. And, you know, looking back, I looked at your LinkedIn and, and it says that you started in this industry back in 1999. I do not think that is even possible. You must've been 10 when you did it, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you you really have a, a wide variety of uh, experience, but you've been with the district since 2017. But give us a little sense of what got you excited about this as a career path and kind of what you're doing throughout that process to get you all the way to Louisville ISD. Okay, sure. Uh, I did start back in 1999. I'm impressed that you looked at the LinkedIn. That's one of the few uh, social media platforms that I'm even on. Uh, I'm not, I'm a an extrovert, but a private person. So that has a lot yep. to do with why, why that's the only place you can really find me. But um, because you're doing the series on women in architecture and women in construction and design, that is something I'm passionate about and yep. willing to forgo that sort of privacy if it if it seems helpful for other women in construction, et cetera. Yep. Uh, so with that said, I graduated from a design school in 1999 from Texas A&M University. Um, and went straight to work for a K through 12 design firm, you know, as a, an intern architect for K through 12. Um, let's see how deep, how deep should I go into all this? I really ended up there Yeah. Uh, at a, almost a mistake. I couldn't <laughs> find the, I couldn't find where, um, where the other architecture firm was, was located. I had an appointment. I mean, for an interview. And, I, you know, I just didn't know Dallas that well. It's yep. embarrassing to say, but I, I had to just cancel that second interview because I just couldn't find them. It was pre, you know, cell phone with maps yep. and all that kind of thing. I was so embarrassed that I just took the first job. I just said, yep, I decided to take this other job. But really, I called my mother from a gas station and said, I, I can't find it. I don't know where it is. <laughs> embarrassing, but true. That's just to give you a little. That's you know, awesome. Couldn't find it. Um, so glad I ended up where I did yeah. work for a K through 12 firm, um, learned about really the whole process, um, the, the industry, you know, the industry yeah. and didn't even realize there was such thing as a project manager yeah. uh, until I worked there. Um, and so I was exposed to project management there, um, gained, gained a little bit of experience under my belt about six years worth and really cut my teeth. This was pre- children. I was married, yep. but three yep. children. So you just work all the time, yep. you know, yep. and then yep. just learn, 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 learn all you can. And I was certainly mm -hmm. into that. Um, so was exposed to project management and, uh, met a licensed architect there 
that was an owner's rep. Okay. And it just planted the seed. You know, he, I developed a good relationship with him and I uh, met with him uh, lots and lots, you know, for purposes of OAC meetings and that kind of thing. And he just planted the seed that, you know, I, I began to think, well, what would it be like in that seat? You know, yeah. what would that be like? Um, and the seed was just planted and I moved on and worked for other firms to gain more experience other than K through 12. I knew yeah. that pigeonholing was not a good plan. Sure. Um, got, gained some more experiences in other uh, areas, met some people, you know, formed Build your network. I mean, yeah. Network. <laughs> Exactly. Now I know that's important. Yep. Like architects don't learn that much about business in school. We just, yeah. it, it's yep. self-learned after yep. school uh, or maybe uh, that's probably enough on that. We just, I, just, I think there should be more, more uh, that in the study of, you know, architecture. I think maybe we should add that. Anyway, um, what happened next? Um, through my network, um, through my network, one of my friends said, look, Julie, I know you, I know you're interested in the owner's side. And one of my friends is a headhunter and she is dying to find people that want to be on the owner's side. And there's yep. a perfect opportunity. Do you want to meet with her? And I said, sure. And that's where um, I took a position. And I think that was the biggest, um, I learned the most in, in the next position about project management and about corporate culture. Yeah. And a little bit about organizational behavior in corporate culture beyond this Dallas based architecture firm kind yeah. of um, culture that I've been a part of up until then. Um, so I worked for the largest real estate uh, company in the world. So we had a lot yeah. of employees. I was a number, yeah. um, but I did, I was assigned to, um, I was assigned to an account that was considered the New York account is what they called it. It wasn't based in New York city. It was the, if you can make it here, you can make you it, make it anywhere. <laughs> they called it the New York account. And at first I struggled. I mean, it, I worked 24 um, seven. I worked, I, I worked a lot of hours to learn everything. Um, and then came along our first baby and I'm taking too much time. Aren't I? Maybe. No, you're perfect. You're perfect. Keep it going. So I had our first baby, uh, took maternity leave, came back and realized something has got to change. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't work 24 seven. I don't, I've got to figure out a way to manage this. Sure. So, um, that's when I got, that's when I really became a project manager. That's when I learned to become efficient. I developed some of the, out of necessity, I developed some efficiency, um, sort of processes and skills and ideas that I still use to this day, yeah. but where if I can get this down, I can make it work and pick my child up from daycare on time. <laughs> and, and I learned to multitask. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway, I learned to multitask. I literally got my lead AP, um, my lead AP uh, certification while in the middle of the night feeding that child. <laughs> like I would study while I was feeding that child in the yeah. middle of the night. I learned to multitask. Um, wow. That's awesome. Isn't that, it's so, it, I, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But so what I've done is I've shared it with about everybody else who will listen. Anyone yeah. who wants to pursue a goal, like anyone on my team, people that I interact with, um, other architects, other females that are having babies, I've shared this story because it's possible. It's doable. There, there's a way. If you want sure. to gain more licensures and certifications and, um, and education, you can do it. You can find yep. these pockets of time. Um, so uh, let's see. So figured out how to do project management well, made it on the, the New York account, and um, then ended up, there was an opening for me to move into uh, an owner's rep position as a project manager for a university. So the reasons I thought that was a good opportunity for me were, or were let's see, number one, I could go back to school. I only had an undergrad degree at that point, right? Okay. And, and I've always felt like, well, something I needed to do was go back and get a master's. That's just part of um, my, my family's values, sure. let's just say. Let's just say. <laughs> no, no external pressure whatsoever, obviously. <laughs> none. None. We'll just leave that one alone. But I'm so glad. My parents, you know, and family, they have high expectations. And, yeah. and um, that's key. So. Yeah. 
I could go back to school for almost free. Um, my children could then almost go to school for free. I like this cost savings, cost plan. savings, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and then thirdly, the hours are just better, sure. right? If you work yeah. for a publicly funded organization and public education, there's a lot more time off. And then, and then the culture, and that's fourth, the culture was different than corporate America. Um, so I uh, went to work for a university system, enjoyed that. And then ultimately what happened is where I am now uh, with Louisville ISD, uh, through the network, you know, through my network, my network reached out to me, a good friend that I'd worked with before back in my first job said, look, we're about to pass this bond and it's going to be over half a billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, is there any interest? Because I know that together we could do this. Yeah. Yeah. And so sort of that that's the history. I mean, I knew who was who I'd be working for and yeah. working with. And and my boss is sharp, 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 uh, super smart. And um, we kind of have the same velocity, rhythm yeah. and speed. And we work well together. And and we had the opportunity to sort of build the processes and organizational structure and take um, the best ideas and not take the worst ideas from all of both of our collective experiences in the past yeah. Yeah. and create a program really and execute it. And that was five years ago. We are four fifths the way through this over half a billion dollar bond. Yeah. And it, I've just had the time of my life getting awesome. to do this. So that's my origin, uh, yeah. my origin story. Well, it's, it's great. There's so much to unpackage there. But one thing I would, you know, you mentioned the corporate culture, things that you learned about the corporate culture. What's one key takeaway that, you know, an, someone that is considering this as a as kind of an avenue for their career path, specifically a female, right, that's moving into that direction. What's, you know, one or two thoughts that you have that you learn that, you know, hey, if I had known this, things would have gone smoother or I might have done things differently. What what would what would be a piece or two of advice that you'd give there? Wow, that's a great question, especially whenever you uh, you focus specifically on females in a male dominated field. Yeah. Um, find a female example that you look up to to model. Yep. If you can find that, if that female will mentor you, um, do that at yeah. all costs. I have had um, female mentors that that I owe, you know, everything to. I would, I yeah. would be here. I, uh, I owe everything to. In fact, I just met with one of them uh, a week ago. You know, we still meet for coffee. She's she's been retired for a while, a good minute. Yeah, yep. and, uh, she's a dear friend. So you need a mentor. Um, also, I'd say study how you're perceived. Okay. Okay. It's important to know how others are perceiving you and to manage that. Um, I'm a big fan, a big fan of recognizing, you know, the data behind human behavior. That's actually what I went back to school for was an MBA with uh, organizational behavior. I just have as it turns out, a huge passion for that. It's yeah, just human yeah. human interaction and communication. Yeah. It's 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 part of what we all do every day. Um, yep. So so don't ignore you know as a female in the field, don't ignore the data and don't ignore what people think of you. Don't don't stop with what people should think of you. Yeah. Study what they're picking up on. One of my, that mentor that I told you about, she has been telling me for a decade, I still can't seem to master this. Um, she's been telling me for a decade, Julie, you're so intelligent. You mask it though. You cover up intelligent with cute. That's what, <laughs> her, her words. Yeah. Her words. And I met, you know, I met with her last week, but then about a month before that. And I said, I st I'm still not doing it. I still cannot. It's still a problem. And she said, that's still important advice, but maybe don't be so hard on yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, be, you need to be your authentic self. You need to bring your authentic self to the world every day. And Julie, I know it's bubbly and, yeah. and bubbly covers up intelligence. I get it. But the people that, um, 
I think she said the people that matter. Um, but if anyone's willing to stay long enough to figure it out, they're going to see the intelligence and you'll have a seat at the table and you'll be able to help make these big decisions that are important to yeah. further the industry and to further your projects and to, to do good things in the world. So um, uh, pay attention to the perception, be your authentic self, but also don't don't lose a lot of the people, um, you know, people's attention. If you are possibly uh, too bubbly, that's yeah. that's a problem. It makes friends in the beginning, you know. Yeah. Not everyone can take you seriously if you're just, um, you know, if, if that's part of who you are. Well, I mean, that's the really good advice for sure. I would say, you know, just my experience in working with you, anybody that spends more than three minutes with you recognizes that you are crazy smart and you've got such good vision and such a great direction. Yes, I think that the bubbly personality helps because it brings people in and wants to have that conversation with you. But I think at the end of the day, anybody that spends any time with you absolutely knows they're dealing with a complete rock star. So that, you know, don't sell yourself short there. Cause I do think you definitely, uh, I don't think you mask it. I think you leverage it. I think it's a superpower <laughs> because, you know, I've, I've talked to your stakeholders. I, you know, we obviously work together because of owner insight, but you know, we've, we've visited with, you know, a lot of the folks that you have to deal with on a daily basis, whether it be the architect or the contractors or their subs, and everybody has such a high, you know, regard for you and what you do and how you do it. So I think you've got a, you have an un, you know, recognized superpower for sure there. Well, I appreciate that. I know your love language is words of affirmation, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that because I receive in that language. So, yep. Well, that's good. I love that. What do you What do you see that the biggest problem for women entering into the construction field is? It because it's a male dominated space. There's, you know, there's sort of a competitive nature just by the environment. Or what do you What do you think that you know the biggest challenges are there in the industry in, in general? It's what you said. It's because it's a male dominated space. So to get uh, for a female to have a seat at the table, um, to have a seat at the table, right, is um, that's a job in and of itself. Sure. Um, yeah. I want to be careful not to be, you know, say anything hurtful uh, about men, um, but often if you look the part, half the job is done. Uh -huh. looking, looking the part in this industry is being a middle-aged white male. Yeah. You know, that's, yep. that's looking the part in a middle age, it, looking the part, let's just say, and staying quiet, a person can get by for a good, good bit of time, but walking in and not looking the part, which would be a yep. female, you know, um, yep. for our discussions purposes, everyone is paying attention and watching and waiting for a mistake sure. or, or critiquing at a higher level. I'm not making this up. The data says all of this, you know, yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, yeah. And I've seen it, you know, and you, so um, the biggest challenge is like you said, um, that it's just a male dominated industry. So people pay attention. And I was recently reading some information about how, if you happen to be the only female that someone knows, right. Yeah. There's kind of this cheerleader approach, an anomaly, um, this kind of idea that, well, you're the only one I know. Therefore, I'll root for you. Yeah. I will root for you. However, beyond the first person that I know, right, beyond the one anomaly, I no longer root for you anymore and I'm critical. Isn't that wow. fascinating? Yeah, that is fascinating. I'd love this. Was that a study, an article or? Uh, I I'll have to find it. I'm taking in so much information. Is it was either a podcast or possibly Adam Grant's new book? I'm reading that. Okay. Yeah. But well, it, if you figure it out, let me know because I'd be curious. Put it in the show notes for sure. But yeah. I mean, that is really, really interesting. What do you remember? What the justification was once you get beyond that as to why that happens? Is it just now you're part of the mix and now you know they they just stop, you know, focusing on the support? I'm almost positive it was from Adam Grant's book and there's okay. actually a name for it. And I'm not sure what the explanation is. It's just okay. you know, based on this study, but it's the idea that, um, you know, this is an anomaly and this is unique. And the first time we've seen um, a, a woman in, in the job meeting, you know, yeah. for 
example. And and I, I'm cheering for you because I want to see this kind of underdog. I think it might yeah. be called the underdog effect. Really? And after the first time, you're you know, I've I've experienced a woman in a job trailer, right? After that, I'm probably not as um willing to give, you know, possibly give you the benefit of the doubt. Huh. Interesting. Well, and I think from your role, right, you are the owner, right, in, in, in the essence of the project. And I think, you know, the you and I have had conversations about the importance of communication and trying to set those project teams up for success early on and kind of establishing, here's the rules by which we're all playing. Here's how we, you know, treat and, and communicate one, you know, with one another, you know, when problems go awry how we sort of address those collectively as a team. And I think you're in a, in an unusual position in that you've got the control over that so that you can be super friendly, but you can also be very direct and assertive. And this is the way it is because this is the way it is. And I think a lot of times, um, and we see it all the time, whether it be other school districts or just other commercial construction teams, you know, when you don't do that, you've get a lot of, um, there's a lot of gray area and people don't, don't have a problem operating in the gray area because there's no accountability, right? There's no, uh, there's no clear lines of expectation or communication. And therefore, you know, you end up getting things that tend to not go super well. And so the earlier that you can assert yourself off in that process, the better. And I would perceive, I think, based on what I know about your stakeholders on your projects, is that you probably don't run into that area. Everybody loves working with you because, you know, one, you, you do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. And, you know, if things are not going well, you're not in the blame mode, you're in the problem solving mode and blame doesn't solve anything, right? At the end of the day, it's like, how do we get this fixed? How do we get beyond it? How do we make the project, you know, get back on track? Because we don't really have, you know, a lot of the luxury of time and effort to, to do anything other than that. Exactly. Problem solving, you know, focusing on the issue, not the person. I have always felt like it was important to talk about the project budget, the yep. project issue, not the person. The, the more you can stay away from a person did something, uh, yep. even if the person's, you know, kind of uh, not followed through on their end of the bargain. Well, it, it hurts less feelings. If sure. You use the organization's name. Well, the architects, you know, and then if some, so I, I take the, I like to what has worked for me in the past uh, and what makes me feel like I'm you know, on the right path is if there's an issue that's not going well, I focus on the organization that is, needs to solve the issue. Yep. But if someone is going above and beyond, I make that personal. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Sarah did a great job on this. And here's why. Sarah, go, Sarah, because you can own that. Sure. And sure. If your organization is, you know, responsible we all know who's going to handle this, yep. but I'm not pointing blame and it doesn't feel so hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's the saying? Praise is public and in specific and, you know, uh, negative feedback or, you know, corrective behavior needs to be more generalized and, and a, a little bit more portable, right. In, in terms of the ability for people to go, well, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm part of a larger problem here because I've worked for that organization or I could do a better job or I could, you know, step up to the plate and fix at least what I know that I have in my direct control. That's the thing, you know, and you, you and I have talked a little bit about this. The passion that I have behind Owner Insight was just trying to create that visibility and accountability in the process, right? It's not the gotchas and it's not, you know, because we automatically assume people are going to be bad actors, but things happen. And if you don't have the, the, you know, the rules of the game clearly defined and you don't have the right people understanding what those rules are, then it's, it's a recipe for disaster, right? So the whole goal behind the platform is to say, okay, let's, let's equalize the playing field. Let's, let's make sure that everybody knows what's expected of them. And, you know, ultimately what's the next best right decision you can make. And part of that is just understanding that sort of psychological aspect of working with teams in general to deliver the results. And so that's, you know, kind of, I, I love kind of how you phrased what you did just a few minutes ago and that you've, you've got to look at that kind of bigger picture and, and then kind of hold people accountable, but you got to understand what your role within that space is. And that's true for, I think personally with the changing, you know, of, of the industry in, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, that applies to both females and males and understanding, you know, what that role is. And if you don't know, you've got to ask and start to, you know, have some deeper level conversations. Absolutely. Accountability. I mean, that's what I learned at the 
you know, with the largest real estate firm in the world is accountability and project management. And these are basics of project management that, you know, I, at this point, I know exactly what to do to manage a project. Yep. But now, um, how do you take that to the next level? You know, how do you do that? Well, I need to do a better job of getting people to do what the project needs them to do. Yeah. And, uh, and might as well do it where they're more happily doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm a relational person and I enjoy successful projects. Absolutely. Absolutely. But even the thing that gives me the most energy is meeting the people and working with the people and, and building relationships and recognizing that these are the good old days. These yeah. are. We're going to look back one day and go, oh, I loved working with that person so much. Absolutely. I remember not as many details about the project, but I remember when um, they called me when I was having a hard time because my parent was sick. Um, and I remember the extra things they did. And I remember yep. their stories about their kids and, you know, the silly things they did. Those are the things I still yep. remember from 20 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe list one or two projects, Steve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, but it's about the experience, right? At the end of the day, it's like that. that, that is what sets everything apart so that you know that if you actually work with those folks again, we've already got this, this, we're, we've got our rhythm down. We've got our jam and, and everybody knows that. They don't want to do anything to let anybody else down because the expectations and the bar has been set so high. Right. So that's where I think, you know, you know, the it makes a lot of sense for project teams to really get to know each other, really understand some of the you know, there's going to be challenges. There's going to be issues. So how do we handle them? How do we deal with them? Right. And, uh, you know, you can only do so much when it comes to software or technology. But it really business at every level, especially in the construction space, is all about relationships and, you know, your ability to own your brand and your personal responsibility, and what your your piece of the puzzle is to to figure out how you're best going to support you know the effort as collective for the team. Right. Yeah. As far as, you know, the the software that I've used in the past, I've used a lot. I mean, at each for each organization that I work for. Um, the average is probably three or four types of project management software where or software that was intended to to help us, you know, house data and yep. manage projects. Um, I mean, when I worked for the the New York account, right? Yeah, I, I was on four different platforms. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, and and um, wow. I mean, we. Do you know what uh, Six Sigma is? Do you know uh -huh. what the yep. is? Okay, well, you and I are the only two that are going to, this is going to resonate with. We'll probably have to cut this out because most yep. designers and construction people, they don't, this is not part of their history. But yep. but um, I became only an orange belt, but an orange belt in Six Sigma because that's the, we used the, the, the demaic phases to manage projects. Yep. Well, improve represents the entire construction uh, phase improve so you yeah. do define measure analyze and then you finally get to improve and close out so the the amount the level of uh, overkill the level of overkill of project management that i was involved in you know on the new york account um has made the rest of the projects that i've managed like a cakewalk <laughs> <laughs> this stuff it's it's just going through the motions but going through the motions isn't enough. That's no fun. Right. Right. You no, know? um, I think it, it's more important to like we like we were just talking about build relationships and um, sharpen that saw and try new things and um, learn more about the data of human behavior and yep. try to form better relationships based on the data and what we know. Uh, what we know motivates other people. Try to understand other people better. And anyway, this is that's the part that I enjoy. So I'm yeah. constantly listening to podcasts on, you know, leadership and strengths finders and communication and motivation. And um, I think you might be one of the only people that's interested in that also, but no, say, yeah. don't underestimate it. That's no. what's going to make you better. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, we all depend on somebody else for our success, right? And the, the more that you can understand them, and how you can communicate with them it means that you actually have to understand yourself first in order to deliver the best possible version of yourself out there for the team so that they have that trust factor 
to show up and want to do the same, right? And, you know, Six Sigma, like you said, is it's an evolving kind of crazy process by which you have to go through that, but it's all about continual improvement. And how do we do what we did on the last project and make it better for the next project? And how much of what we want to do better depends on the people to do it, right? And so mm-hmm. you're, you're um, you know, the whole process is there's, there's a lot of, you know, orientation in terms of what your actionable steps are, but it really all comes down to the executables for the people. Right. And in the software, you know, all those software platforms, you know, that I've used, um, I was sort of taking the the best and the worst of each of them yep. and incorporating uh, these ideas into my own spreadsheet, if you will, you know, my <laughs> own management style yep. that yep. was really going to make this, what was really going to help me manage this project, that kind of thing. And then um, when I came on board, like I said, five years ago, uh, my boss and I were looking for project management software. And I can't, but I'm so thankful that we came across uh, OI. It was presented to us by word of mouth, you know, by peers and people that we know. So, I mean, OI had that going for them. You can't buy that kind of marketing or advertising. That's the best kind, word of mouth. And we had uh, two individuals we that that shared with us that they use OI and they're from, you know, kind of different ends of the end of universe. Right. Yep. Yeah. And then, um, and a good friend of mine just said, well, do you just want to come over and I can just show you in your boss, I can just show you guys do yeah. a little walkthrough. And we said, of course, so we did that. And then, um, when we reached out to your organization, you came out personally and did a yeah. walkthrough, um, and, and the content of the software, you know, having reflected back on all of the different platforms that I've used in the past, I looked at the software and went, this has everything that we need and not much more that we don't. This is yeah. perfect. Uh, this has what we need, but not a lot of extra that we don't. Well, I appreciate that. That means the world to me. I, I was glad when I went up to that meeting that uh, I, you know, you guys just didn't like, oh my God, this guy, What what's up with this guy? Because you guys asked a lot of hard questions and I was just very focused on trying to, you know, help show how we've tried to solve problems for other school districts. And you were so friendly and so accommodating, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you, had, you had an intimidating group there that day. And I'm like, just by myself, I'm like, oh. So it was, I, I'm so glad I didn't uh, mess that up. <laughs> we did not mean to be intimidating. I'm sorry. No, you, you weren't actually. It's just, you know, you, know, you overthink things sometimes, right? At the end of the day. And, and I knew who had originally referred us. And I remember his advice was don't screw it up. Right. Cause they, you know, they liked it. <laughs> we, lo- we loved it. And the other, the other pieces that I've shared with different uh, peers of mine, you know, that ask about project management software and the like is I share it. Look, I have worked for an organization that was also shopping for software. Okay. And we, when we submitted the, the um, RFQ for qualifications and went through the whole nine yards paid. I'm not going to tell you how much a lot more, a lot more um, than, than, you know, our, our invoice comes in for every month. Okay. And um, that's been more than, seven years ago. Okay. And their software still isn't working for them. Yep. Yep. Painful. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Don't build software uh, that's custom. Well, what we found is because we have OI, we don't have to go out and secure a company and ask them to customize the software for us because yep. the standard uh, yep. design meets our needs. That's what it does. And you guys, the, the, the website is never, ever down. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times that, you know, on the other project management software is that the website is down and you have to wait a day or even something else that I've experienced in the past on the New York account is um, it was just like being hamstrung in many ways to move from define to measure. Um, A new process was we would submit a Salesforce request and wait a period of three days before you could move from one phase to another. And that oh. um, that just wasn't helpful. So no. that was one of the parts and pieces where we took the best and left the worst. Well, we left yep. the worst idea that that's just not necessary. So I felt like um, to expand a little bit more on uh, something I shared with you before is 
OI is a tool we use. It's not a tool that manages us. Right, so I'm not right. able to, for example, um, submit a Salesforce request just so that I can, from documentation purposes, move from one phase to another. That's just not helpful. All of a sudden, I'm a slave to the the tool rather yeah. than me using this tool to manage my projects. I want to manage my projects. I don't want my tool to, you know, attempt to manage me. I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's and that's the hard part about software, right? Is that you know a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of that is not. Um, really built in or around the process. And we've tried to tr keep it super simple. So it's adaptable for whatever the environment is at the end of the day. But, um, you know, we don't throw a lot of unnecessary things at it. You know, there, like you said, there, there are other platforms out there that have a, maybe a lot more features and capabilities, but they're really not the ones that school districts use. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, yeah, we've, we've really, I think, tried to stay true. And, and as you know, you know, since meeting me, it's like, we're always taking in feedback, trying to make the platform better. All of where we've adapted since you and I started working together has come from direct feedback that we've gotten from our clients to, to improve their life in some capacity is the key, but not overcomplicate it and try and, you know, throw a bunch of, um, you know, wrinkles into the process. Because when you do that, then you get a lot of frustration and confusion. Right. Right. Well, How so, you know, I got overtime. I'm so sorry. No, no, you're great. This is great. I just had a, a couple of few questions for you. Just, you know, could you could you give us a perspective of, of you know, kind of within your uh, day to day responsibilities? What's your day like and sort of how does Owner Insight make that a little better for you? Um, My day to day is like many people's filled with meetings galore <laughs> meetings galore and then uh because the the calendar is stacked with meetings uh i often unfortunately multitask during the meetings if people yep. aren't walking in the door they're texting and needing an immediate response yeah calling and needing an immediate response and just just the fire drills that are part of uh being responsible for as many campuses as we're responsible yeah. for yeah. Uh, that's just that's just part of it. It's never going away. It's not a reflection of, you know, poor management of projects. It's campuses. We have 90. I mean, it's a bunch of bunch of buildings where we are uh, renovating and, um, you know, impacting them. Yeah. So then my my day to day among uh, the paperwork project yep. management is paperwork. That is what it is. I would love to be out in the field more often. I want to be in the field more often. I get in energy from yep. it. Yeah, uh, everybody does. It's where you'd rather be. Yep. Sometimes, you know, just a slave to the paperwork. So, um, I won't go into detail about the paperwork. I'm pretty sure anybody who watches this or listens like to it, right there with you, my mom. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the only one watching this. Um. I'm kidding. Um, yeah. <laughs> it knows all the paperwork that's that's required in the day to day. But my favorite um, part of the day, I'm sure you won't be surprised, is when, um, you know, I get the opportunity to have some human interaction yeah. with someone. And the thing I'm growing to love more and more is having to have a difficult conversation and doing that well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Not great it. that you have to have them, but great that you're feeling more comfortable doing them. Yeah. I'm doing most of them is the word not well, unwell, you know, but sometimes I do it well. You know, I'm trying to do have more of those well. Project me. I come in with the bad news. Yeah. That's what I do a lot of the time. Is, uh, we're over budget. We're going to need to VE. Yeah. You're, you're behind schedule. I need you to create. Um, a schedule that works. You've got to get in schedule. Yeah. Ugh, this team member, let me tell you why they're not working. Can you can you see how that's not working? It either has yeah. to improve or an adjustment has to be made. These are not fun conversations, but I'm learning how to have them better. Yeah. You know, in a healthier way that, you know, that my goal is to be respectful, factual, to consider what it might be like on the other side to be on the receiving end. Sure. And, and and be mindful of the success of the project and yep. the district at all costs. That's the goal. Um, trying to get people in the right spot, you know, and get them sitting in the right seats on the bus. Yeah. Not just the right people on the bus, but sitting in the right seat on the bus so they can use their strengths 
And um, so that we're not putting them in a spot where their weaknesses are critical, you know, where they're never going to succeed. Yep. They're, um, yeah. So well, and that's, you know, that, that's, that's good. That's good project leadership, right? It's, it's one thing to be a manager, but the other thing is being able to say, look, I'm going to step up to the plate and be a good project leader. And even in those situations where I've got to have those uncomfortable conversations, people will be willing to take that feedback and, you know, and apply it and leverage it and utilize it for the benefit point forward when it's coming from somebody they respect and they admire, and they know that it's not personal. It's using the data and the facts to, you know, reach the conclusion that we're at. And at the end of the day, almost everybody that isn't doing a great job probably knows it. They just, you know, there's, there's a difference between saying you're doing a really bad job and you need to fix it to versus, Hey, this isn't exactly going the way we want it to go. So what do we need to do together to kind of, you know, solve this, right? How do we, how do we, how do we get this thing back on track or how do we fix this particular issue? Or like you said, do we have the right personnel in place? And there's just, you know, both probably get to the end result. One's a lot more direct and leaves a lot of, um, as I always like to say, there's a lot of resentment, which is the super secret promise of revenge. Or the other one is buy-in and buy-in is like, I'm all over that. You know, you know, Julie, I want to step up to the plate because I want to do a good job for you. You know, it's, you know, un uncomfortable situations are tough. They're especially tough for someone like you that's got to be in them. But at the end of the day, because you're building that rapport and you're being that great project leader, I think they probably come a lot more naturally than you probably give yourself credit for. Well, I appreciate that. I think it's important. I do think it's important to build a rapport and build relationships. And that's really what I'm more concerned with. Even I can't, I'm not really supposed to admit it, but even more than the project success, you know, <laughs> more about relationships. But yeah. that doesn't mean that um, I think that makes me better at the job. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you are, um, I mean, that's why you're a rock star at what you do. Well, as, as we look to wrap up, is there anything that you might, um, be willing to offer by way of a school district or leaders out there like, you know, we, we've been depending on the tools of the contractor or the architect. You know, we've, we've had some other podcasts where we've really do dove into that. But from a school district's perspective, it's really, a, you know, not the best idea because if you're not in control of the data, you're really not in control of your project. But any anything that you might share for someone out there that might be considering bringing owner insight into their school district as to why? Sure. Uh, beyond having a uh, complete visibility to what is going on on the project and the status updates and the project progress updates regarding the paperwork, you yeah. know, the paperwork part on where you are on submittals and RFIs and ASIs. Beyond just having that visibility, do not overlook the value added from the data analytics that can be run based on the um how the project is going. So in other words, we've run we've run the data data analytics when necessary on projects that seem to be uh, at risk, yeah. possibly at risk, a potential future risk, okay? Just a little bit wobbly. And the beauty of the the data analytics that we used to not have in the olden days when we did, you know, did submittals, I put I put handwritten um labels on submittals they yeah, weren't yeah. Input, okay so the, the the value that we have today that we didn't used to have with the analog um way of life i guess you could say is we can run these reports and we can run reports to see where the paperwork is getting held up um whose court the paperwork has been in and we can for too long in, in yeah. excess of the uh, required time frame. We're seeing um, these reports tell us how quickly things are being turned around and by whom and what's overdue and how long it's been in each court, um, which help us helps us to uncover um, the true sense of where the project is yeah. and where we can improve. And the key keywords are holding the teams accountable. Yep. It's kind of a buzzword these days, you know, holding holding teams accountable. But that's what project management is. It's yep. holding every, making sure everyone is holding up their end of the bargain bargain for what they committed to do, and the the data analytics that are available today through Owner Insight don't overlook the power of that. That's going to make you better. 
Oh, that's great. Well, I uh, thank you for sharing that. That's that's fantastic. Well, I am so grateful that you took the time to join us for the podcast. You are I could talk to you for hours. So we may have to do a sequel sooner rather than later because I mean it we we could just do a whole podcast on communication and just geeking out on on the, the data analytics on that. I would love that. And anytime yeah. it has to do with uh women in this industry, I'm in. Absolutely. Well, we're going to do more because we are committed to helping, you know, promote that and, and, and great, bring great data and content out for, for that audience. And, and for all, all people that are in the construction space, not just school districts, but everybody, I, they benefit from just seeing such great professionals like yourself doing what you're doing. So thanks well, for I being a part of this. Thanks for all your comments, Steve. I appreciate you. Of course. Thank you so much. And um, <laughs> we'll be back again with another episode for Owner Insight. But Julie, thanks so much for being a part of this. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.